صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله وعلى روحك وبدنك الطاهرة صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليكم مني جميعا سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين خصوصا سيدي ومولاي كفيل الهواشم قمر بني هاشم أبا الفضل العباس عليه السلام السلام عليكم جميعا يا شهداء كربلاء ورحمة الله وبركاته أما بعد قال الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الدين عند الله الإسلام آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد على محمد A second in honor of Umm al-Banin A third in honor of Al-Qasim son of Imam al-Hassan al-Mujtaba with your loudest of voices <coughs> The very famous political commentator and far-right conservative Ben Shapiro has made very interesting accusations and claims against the entirety of the religion of Islam. There is no doubt that typical rhetoric from that spectrum, be it whether it may be the far left or the far right, any form of extreme politically, ideologically, does not have a basis in modernism in the form of maintaining a centralistic way of life. As Muslims, we do not necessarily subscribe to ideologues or ideologies 100% out of even jeopardizing our values and principles. There are principles where we might find and resonate with those who identify with the far right politically in America, conservative, right wing, republic, or the far left, liberal, democratic, there are principles and values each might hold and accept. For example, we as Muslims disagree with any notion of a Muslim ban. We are Muslims, many of us are refugees. If such a ban was implemented in our tenure of arriving and in immigration, this would not be fair because many of these individuals are fleeing war-torn countries that ideologues and superpowers in the West were the causes for making these immigrate, immigrants immigrate to begin with, for example. Or you might find us disagreeing with certain aspects of policy in regards to modernization of gender pronouns, let's say. That if a man today decides to call himself Ashley and he as bulky and husky as he is, at that moment has every right to enter the female women's laboratory, let's say, as perhaps one of our sisters or mothers is adjusting her hijab. One might look at some values and policies of the far left and be like, I don't agree with this. And another might look at the far right and be like, I don't agree with this. But that doesn't mean we all stand together in, belief in believing that we disagree that poverty is a myth. We agree that poverty is an issue and these are two sides that agree on the same issue. We agree that human rights should be maintained. We agree that freedom of speech should be maintained. Nonetheless, we find agreements and we find disagreements and this is the beauty of a pluralistic society where you are entitled to your opinion. 
However, we have noticed many commentators and political analysis becoming subhanallah mujtahidun in Islam more than the mujtahidun themselves. And they will begin to define for you what your Islam means for you. You might find it someone like Sean Hannity, Terry Crews, these individuals who despise Islam, Bill Maher, or other individuals that have made it very clear through their rhetoric and their shows that Islam is generally not welcomed here if you believe in it wholeheartedly. And likewise, Ben Shapiro is no exception. Of course, this doesn't mean we completely despise the complete belief of every single principle espoused by the far-right ideologues. As we said earlier, one person doesn't have to forego completely identifying into a certain political group because they agree or disagree. La, we find areas where we accept, we find areas where we disagree. But with this instant, this individual came forth and made some audacious claims as if he himself was a mujtahid knowing more about Islam. And the most bizarre belief is when someone says, I want to tell you about your religion, but I hate your religion. Why would I care to listen to you then? My religion, I love it. I'm not going to take your interpretation and you hate it at the same time. But nonetheless, a very influential figure. And because you have and carry this influence, you deserve a reply. At the end of the day, if any Tom, Dick, and Harry speaks negatively about Islam, it doesn't bother us. And we don't lose sleep to that. People have done it to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam day and night. You are a kathib, you are a sahir, you are a sha'ir. You are someone that is a liar, O Rasulullah. You make things up. You are a magician. All this nonsense of Quran and deen is because you are a magician. Rasulullah received hate. Don't worry if you receive it from just anyone. But when people of high influence who should be intellectual, the man, a graduate of Harvard University, of high influence, speak about Islam in such a bizarre manner, you deserve a reply. Because we will not let you speak on our behalf. We are just as American as you are, if you forgot. This country wasn't built only to satisfy our particular group. Even though there are groups that might want that to be the case. Alhamdulillah, some of us have lived, have worked, have provided tax money, are willing to serve, to defend, to provide, to ensure the betterment of our society. We are proud of this. We like to share the message of Islam peacefully, humanitarianistically. You do not claim the West for yourself. We do not hate the West. We do not hate the East. We hate some aspects from the West. We hate some aspects from the East. This backward, bigoted, stereotypical mindset, be it in the East, West, North, South, should all go into the trash. You, however, have been spewing it left, right, and center. And as Muslims, we will not tolerate this. And because you have the freedom to speak and have that freedom, we also have the freedom to reply. Let us tonight reply back to some bizarre accusations that have been regurgitated, if I say it very politely, by this individual, by examining what exactly he said regarding Islam. He published a video a few years back through a few organizations, his predominantly, that indicated and alluded to the myth, according to him, of the tiny radical Islamic presence so that we understand where this is coming from and where he is coming from. There has always been this narrative that whenever you see Islamic extremism, what do Muslims, and for those who have some respect with regards to Muslims and Islam, what do they generally say? When you see extremists like ISIS and the riffraff, like these individuals, we always say that these is a, what, a minority of a radical group of individuals, a minority. And how do we substantiate this? We then follow up by saying, if it were the majority of Muslims, then everyone would be in trouble. Because Muslims, if I'm not mistaken, roughly 1.8 to about 2 billion individuals today that practice their religion, that identify as Muslims. There are countries like Indonesia with 200 and 5 million Muslims, like Iraq, 80 million Muslims, like in Afghanistan, for example, over 50 million Muslims and so forth. In Egypt, 80 million Muslims as well, or 60 or so million Muslims in other countries. Jordan, with a little bit less of a Muslim population. All these people, they practice Islam and they hold on to it 
like it's literally their life. He claimed that this myth is a reality. It's not just a minority. It's everyone that's Muslim is a radical. Why? How is this the case? He begins to explain the following. He predicates this all by saving face. Before attacking Islam, he acknowledges that one minute, I agree that there are violent passages in the Old and New Testament. This is something many polemicists like to do. Before they begin bashing, completely ridiculing a certain set of beliefs, they want to save face at first by saying, it's not just you, by the way, that, for a lack of better words, has evil in your worldview. It's also us. But the difference between you and I is that we've never seen anyone who was Jewish or Christian kill in the name of their religion. I have seen in yours. In Islam, I've seen many who came and carried radical, and he claimed it, Sharia law, and with that became an extremist. This is interesting, because by predicating your whole argument that the orthodox Judaistic worldviews carry some very radical opinions, the New Testament also has passages that are evil according to him, or not evil, but very violent. By doing this, this does not save face. Because what you are hitting when you discuss Islam is you discuss the Qur'an at the same time. Are Muslims the Qur'an? Or is the Qur'an the Qur'an? You said this is only in our books, but it's not found with people. You then superimpose that every extremist is believing in Islam 100% properly and implementing it properly. Does, does any Muslim right now, right now, right here, agree that an extremist Muslim is behaving according to what Allah wants properly or no? Why did you then claim that every radical is believing in Islam properly? So for example, the other billions of Muslims, they don't practice Islam properly, it's only a minority that practice Islam properly. properly. Where did you come up with this? You gave the terrorist justification for their action. You claim they looked at the Qur'an and they became good Muslims by following the rules of implementing violence. Since when did you get the authority of calling a Muslim not a Muslim or a Muslim a true Muslim? Who made you a mujtahid? Who made you an ayatullah? Who made you a mufti all of a sudden to say who's Muslim who's not Muslim? We have maraji' We have ulama that tell us how to be Muslims. Where did you come from? And you claim that the radical extremist takfiri groups, they're the real Islam, and everyone else is just shy. Everyone else is not implementing their religion. But that wasn't even the basis of his bloody, pathetic argument. His argument was, this is a myth that the radical minority is the case. Rather, almost a majority of Muslims are radical. And he literally said it verbatim, are you scared yet? What does he do? He begins, as we mentioned, saving face. The Bible and the Old Testament, these both have scary passages. But let's look at what Muslims do. Apparently, all Muslims are subject to his opinion of the definition of radical, which is something we will examine soon. Muslims in Egypt are roughly, let us say, 80 million that reside. Around 80 million. He references a Pew Research study that shows about 65% of 80 million Muslims living in Egypt all believe in Sharia law. Dun, dun, dun. What is Sharia law? And because of that, 65% of 80 million, which is about 55 million Muslims roughly, are all radical. So it's not a minority. So do you see where he is getting? Anyone who believes in Sharia law is what? Radical. Because he, mashallah, Ayatollah bin Shapiro knows what Sharia law is. He can define it for you and tell you who's extreme and who's a good Muslim and who's a pretty bad Muslim. His definition is whoever believes in Sharia law. I ask you, what is Sharia law? Do you know what Sharia law is? Do you know? Literally, my last name is Al Shara, Sharia, basically. Sharia law, do you know what it is? Can you explain to me what it is? I guarantee you 100% and I can almost swear on it. Because it's a petty matter, I'm not going to. I can guarantee you he has no idea what Sharia law is. He has no idea what Sharia law is. And I'm this close to saying Wallah. He has no idea what a Sharia al Islamiya is. What does he know? He knows what he is force fed by the mainstream media. He turns on the TV. I see he's a very scary looking bearded man. That represents all of them. 
And for some reason, if anyone believes in al-Sharia al islamiyah they become extremists. Okay. Sharia Allah, let me explain to you what it is. Sharia Allah is your private life and the rules and morality that you engage with in your private life. That's it. You as a Muslim, what do you do in your private life? In your private life, you have to pray. This is not something that is contingent on society. Hence why we are saying private life. You as an individual, the Sharia al-Islamiyah calls for Salah five times every single day. This is Sharia Allah. You as an individual have to fast once every year for an entire month to become sympathetic to those who are underprivileged. You as a Muslim have to get, give obligatory charity. Give it to those who are needy. The miskeen, the yatim, the asir. This is Sharia Allah. You as a Muslim have to make sure that whenever you see oppression, al-amr bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar, you have to stop it. If a woman or a man is being abused publicly, it is wajib, an obligation to end it. You as a Muslim have to visit God's house and reflect on being a better Muslim such that everything else we just discussed is becoming more of a reality and done more genuinely. This is Sharia Allah. But according to him, it's what? Extremism. Let me ask the following question following this. What is extremism? He says that we need to push for a ban on these things. This is what he genuinely, genuinely believes in. That we should ban Sharia Allah. Sharia al Islamiyah, this was an attempt in the United States a few years ago in the states of Alabama, of Texas, and Tennessee. Right now, there is a Sharia law ban in Tennessee, Alabama, and Texas. And there is also a Sharia law ban in Montreal, Canada. What does it mean when you ban the Sharia al Islamiyah? What does it mean? Are you going to stop praying in Alabama? No, we still pray. That law is not being implemented then. Are you still going to fast when you're in Texas? Yeah, you're going to fast. So why is there a law that is redundant? Why is there a law that is just a waste of time and a waste of energy? You know what they say? Him and his likes and his counterparts, they say it's because we do not want stoning. We do not want beheading. We do not want crucifixion. We do not want lashing nor whipping. We do not want what? The penal code in America implemented by these Muslims. As if stoning, beheading, crucifixion and whipping was a problem we had in America. Yeah, it was a big problem. Muslims were whipping everyone. Everyone they saw, they were like, hey, haram alik, ta'al, ta'al, hey, give me your hand. We don't want, want people cutting hands off. Ban Sharia Allah. Yeah, yeah, it was a problem. Oh man, there were people who took my pack of gum in school. How I wish I could have, hey, give me your hand. Now I need to implement the Sharia. Was this ever a problem in the United States? No, but it's to fill your ego with more pride. Make it more inflated and inflamed so that you can say we're banning their religion. Ya Habibi, banning Sharia Allah is as pathetic as saying you're going to ban the month of Ramadan. We're going to still fast. So why do you do this? This is a concern still though, as redundant as this pathetic law is, it's still a concern. Why? Number one, we do not want to give you the satisfaction of saying you did something against Muslims. Because you never did. But number two, this acts as a foundation, brothers and sisters. In which way? This acts as a foundation for later on making more restrictions on Muslims that is palpable and tangible. Which way? In Montreal, Canada, they banned Sharia law. Do you know which law came after the Sharia law ban by about a few years? The hijab ban. Canada, we understand it as being a very democratic looking, liberal looking, you know, very left wing esque under the authority of. Prime Minister Trudeau, such a welcoming, wholesome place, a province in Canada. Right now, it is illegal for Muslim women to wear the headscarf in and work in the legal force. How did this happen? This is not just found in France today. This is found in Montreal, Canada. How did this happen? They first banned Sharia Allah. And an extension from that, they can ban the hijab because it is with part and parcel that pathetic law. So this is why this is a concern, and this happened in Michigan as well. They tried to, in Michigan, by the way, the census came out. In Metro Detroit, we have over 400,000 Muslims. Alhamdulillah, roughly, roughly three-fourths of those are Shia. But it doesn't matter to us, Muslim, Shia, Sunni, Sufi, 
sushi, it doesn't matter to us. These people are human beings, Americans at the end of the day. They just want to make a living, ends meet, and show love and practice their faith at the same time. They tried to ban Sharia Allah in Michigan. A Republican state legislator came forth and proposed. This was a woman. She came forth and proposed that we need to ban Sharia Allah in Michigan. Why? For these reasons. Stoning, beheading, yeah, mashallah, a problem that doesn't even exist in Iraq. But yes, we need to ban it in Michigan. We had, alhamdulillah, a Democratic state legislator, a brother Shi'i, in his 20s. He won the election by running for office, becoming a state legislator. May Allah bless him, brother Abdullah Hamoud. And he ran for office, and because he was present in Lansing, the municipality over there, the Congress in Michigan, because of his presence, he was able to fight this law and not have it passed. Again, it wouldn't have changed anything, but we're not going to give you the satisfaction of saying, look what I did to the Muslim population, which highlights one thing that's very important, brothers and sisters, your social and political engagement. If you do not have Muslims representing you, then you will have non-Muslims representing you. Is it bad to have a non-Muslim representing you? No. If they understand your concerns and your issues, there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes we would wish that in the Middle East, there were good non-Muslims running our countries. Wallah. And not some bad, corrupt Muslim. How many countries could you think of right now? Without mentioning names. How many countries do you wish? Yani, I wish that if the leader, the president, the prime minister was a kafir ahlan wa sahlan, if they care about giving me electricity, water, and food at the end of the day, why do I care about what their aqidah says or what they do during a certain month or not? But it's no issue to have a non-Muslim representing you. But what about when there's a non-Muslim who despises your values as a Muslim? At that point, would you rather have a Muslim representing you or someone that hates you represent you? This brother we saw ran for office and actually provided a service to the Muslim American community. If you are going to live in America, get involved. Don't just sit and accept and act like I am subject to all the benefits and I'm going to suck some of these benefits out and not contribute to any way. And not contribute to any way whatsoever. No, bilakis. We as Muslims, we take the example of Imamuna Ali ibn Musa al-Ridha salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallamu alayhi wa sallamu What do we mean by Imam al-Ridha? Imam al-Ridha was a refugee. Imam al-Ridha, is he from Mashhad? Is he from Tus? Is he from Khurasan? No, he's not. Is he from the Persian Peninsula, what is now modern-day Iran, the northeast of Iran? Is he? No, he's not. He's a refugee. Why is he a refugee? He lived as Wali As. He lived as the successor of Ma'mun. He lived in the royal confines because he was forced. Refugees do not do these movements on purpose they make them happen because they happen they make these decisions because they are forced because they're running from war-torn countries because they're running from poverty from extremism Imam Rida was forced to go to Mashhad because al Ma'mun al-Abbasi compelled him to come along with him what did Imam Rida do just suck the benefits of Mashhad just suck like a parasite the benefits of Ma'mun al-Abbasi and the province and all the benefits that it has to offer? No, he spread Islam properly. He was a manifestation of Islam Ahlul Bayt for he is Islam Ahlul Bayt. And he showed us that as a refugee, you can represent your religion properly. You do not necessarily need to agree 100% with the authoritative figure and their policies. Did, did Imam Rida agree with the government of Ma'mun? Bil'akus, he was against it to a large degree. He agreed with some of the issues. That's why he would get involved and make sure and ensure the rights of the Muslims were preserved. And he disagreed with Al-Ma'mun's oppressive, corrupt policy. We, as Muslims, take his example. Are we not Radawiyun? We follow the example of our Imam Radha We may go somewhere far away due to com being compelled. And once we are there, we may agree with some values, we may disagree as well. But while we're there, we can all agree on one thing. I will stand with you, my fellow citizen against oppression stand with the oppressed against the oppressor but one factor that contributes to oppression is fear-mongering rhetoric of the likes such as Ben Shapiro and his riffraff colleagues by proposing that millions of people 
over 55 million in Egypt, for example, believe in Sharia Allah, therefore they are radical. Do you know what else he claimed? He says, in America, this is where it gets scary. In America, we have 3 million Muslims. La ilaha illallah, that's scary. 3 million Muslims. Do you know the Pew Research study? Do you know what it did in America? It surveyed all the Muslims. Did you get surveyed, by the way? I don't remember last time I'm, I got surveyed. It surveyed all the Muslims, and do you know what they concluded? It concluded that 15% of 3 million Muslims all find it sanctioned to attack unarmed civilians for the cause of Islam. How pathetic is this logic? 15% of 3 million Muslims in America, and there are roughly 3 million Muslims, alhamdulillah, and inshallah there are more. 15% of 3 million Muslims all agree that it's okay to attack and kill citizens that are not involved. I ask you, are we all Muslims inshallah? When was this the last time you were questioned and surveyed by Pew Research? I don't remember being surveyed. Did you, have you ever gotten asked, what do you think about uh, killing unarmed civilians? But then let me ask you, I disagree with that stat. I disagree. I don't believe 15% of 3 million Muslims, over 500,000 Muslims, actually think killing unarmed civilians is okay. No Muslim says that. I will tell you right now. No Muslim says that. Prove it. Hatu burhanakum. Show me your evidence. What's your evidence? Did you come to Dearborn? I'm in Dearborn. I don't remember seeing you there. Where did you get the stat from? Where did it come from? But what about the reality that there are a hadith that talk about punitive laws? Punitive laws, meaning the penal code, meaning capital punishment. Because when they speak about stoning, killing, crucifixion, they also love to substantiate by saying, look at your Qur'an. I look at the Qur'an and I need to remind myself, the Qur'an it's a law for all Muslims for every time period. Indeed, of course it is. But there is a content and a context at the same time. Content and what? Context at the same time. What is content? The rules. What is context? The situation and circumstance. The rules are there, but the context is not there. The context, is it there? Are we living in an Islamic society? and an Islamic nation? No, we are not. We're not living. Furthermore, who gave you the authority to claim what is Islamic and what is not? I want to go to my maraji'. May Allah bless them and prolong their lives. Grand Ayatullah al-Uzma al-Marja' al-Dini al-A'la al-Sayyid Ali al-Sistani hafidhahu Allah wa madda Allah fi umrihi al-Sharif. Sayyid Ali al-Sistani has said it very clear that the implementation of the hudud of Allah the penal code, the capital punishment to sever limbs, for example, this is not implemented in the age where we have the absence of a publicly accessible, infallible ma'soom. If Sahib al Zaman is present, he can implement this. Right now, no one can. Some say, what about countries that are Islamic republics? They are doing it. They do it, that's up to them. They have their own structure and system of religiosity, whether it's the concepts or the conceptual understanding of like wilayatul faqih, for example. That's with them. If a nation has voted for this, then they voted for this. Because I remember in 1979 when the referendum happened in the Iranian revolution, 98.5% voted for the system of Islamic governance. 98.5, that's the majority of society. The other point. 5% or 1.5% were adversaries to, that, to the baby Islamic Republic at that time. The MEK and the likes, Munafiqeen Khalq and the likes, and the Shah loyalists. So a vast majority of the citizens wanted Islamic law. Okay, if they want Islamic law, can you say no, you can't have it? Do we not live in a democracy in this day and age? Or are we still living in the guides of communism and the Shiuiyah? If people voted for something, you give them what they want. A majority of people voted for this, you give them what they want. Khalas. Furthermore, the Hakim al-Shar'i can implement the Hudud, but he can also forgive. He can also forgive. If you read Islamic history, by the way, you will find that it's very rare you can point to a point in history, and I challenge Ben Shapiro and his colleagues right now, point right now in Islamic history where you found the legal rulings of Ithbat Hudud Allah 
of confirming that the transgressions against Allah happened such that it makes these perpetrators subject to capital punishment by a sharia and they were implemented properly and the person was executed. You will rarely find a case like this because we know the restrictions on performing capital punishment whether it's فَقْطَعُ أَيْدِيَهُمَا جِزَاءً بِمَا كَسَبَ نَكَالًا مِنَ اللَّهِ or وَجْلِدْهُمَا the jald or the crucifixion or the banishing of the mufsid fil ard number one you have to remember content context content wise the mufsid fil ard is subject to this 90 percent of the time we will talk about those who commit adultery and those who steal with respect to the concept of severing the limbs and so forth but 90 percent of the capital punishment in the quran 90 percent is for the mufsid fil ard i have a question to ben shapiro do you know what the mufsid fil ard is you might say, no, because I don't know how to read Arabic. Okay, then if you don't know how to read the Quran, that claimed, if you want to know me, you have to know Arabic first. Inna anzannahu what? Quran and what? Inglizian? No, no, Arabian. If you want to know how to implement the rules of Islam, the book itself says, I beg you read me in Arabic, because you will misunderstand my knowledge. Huh, you don't know how to read Arabic then. So what do you do? You go to the ulama. You don't go to Fox News and the likes and say this is what Islam must mean. Go to the ulama. When was the last time you saw Sayyid Ali Sistani issue a fatwa, cut the hands of this person? Huh? When was the last time you saw Sayyid Ali Sistani say kill and sever and sever the limbs of this individual? I did see a fatwa like this. Yeah, I did. To the mufsid fil ard. Who is the mufsid fil ard? Daesh. Daesh is the mufsid fil ard. Unless you feel sad that Daesh is receiving capital punishment. Is that why you're complaining? Are you sad that Daesh is getting killed like this? I'm not sad. After hearing what they did to the Yazidis, I'm not sad. After the genocide and sex slavery I saw they did, I'm not sad that they get capital punishment. I'm not sad at all. Are you really hurt that Daesh is being crucified by the Hajj al-Shaabi? Are you hurt by that? Does it hurt your heart that you want to now ban it against the Mufsid fil ard? If you like that, then you can continue arguing for that. These ayat, they say these are the for the mufsid fil ard. What is a mufsid fil ard? Number one, fasad, corruption fil ard on the earth. What does it mean by corruption? Rape. Fasad is rape. Murder and genocide. That is a mufsid. That is fasad. They're spreading fasad. What fil ard? What does it mean fil ard? Of course, it's in the ard. It's not in the qamar, not on the moon. When the Quran says fil ard, what does that mean? It means that they travel the earth and they do this. Wherever they go, they are doing this. Okay, how long are we going to allow them to do this for? These people, Allah has ordained for them a punishment. These people, they deserve this Sharia Allah capital punishment. If that's all you understood Sharia Allah to mean, then I will tell you where this is implemented. For these individuals, capital punishment. You somehow neglected the 99.5% of other aspects of Sharia Allah when it comes to obligatory charity, when it comes to Al Amr Bil Ma'roof, when it comes to Al Nahi An Al Munkar, when it comes to humbling yourself in Khushu and Salah, when it comes to sympathizing with those who are underprivileged by fasting for an entire month, when it comes to reflecting upon Allah's glory and mercy by visiting His house in Hajj. You forgot all that and you said, this is the only meaning of Sharia Allah and whoever believes in it is a radical. This is this academic to the highest degree. And someone who graduated from Harvard shouldn't be this way. Harvard your University should be ashamed of you. They should revoke the degree they gave to you. They should revoke. I call right now Harvard University. Revoke Ben Shapiro's degree. Because this is this genuine and this academic. Is that how you identify and plagiarize and superimpose? You take from here. This is the meaning. You make your own definition and superimpose your definition on two billion Muslims. Is this what it is? Is this academic? Is this logical? Is this reasonable? No, it's not. Therefore, brothers and sisters, such logic and rhetoric, respond back to it. Give a reply. Don't let some riffraff, phony, pathetic, warmongering-esque in their rhetoric individual scare you. Reply back to them. You have a voice. Freedom of speech doesn't only belong to the individual whose complexion is a little lighter than yours. It belongs to everyone. The black 
the yellow, the red, the white. Alhamdulillah, we live in a country that recognizes all ethnicities and backgrounds. Alhamdulillah, we say thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We thank Allah. We do thank Allah. And those who hate certain policies have every right. As many Americans hate policies and disagree, how many of us have seen when Trump was in office, the last administration, how many Americans spoke against him and his policies? Okay, I don't have a right to do that as well. I have a right too. I'm just as involved. And just as you have a right to voice your opinion against Islam, by the way, you have every right to voice your opinion against Islam. You don't have a right to lie. You don't have a right to make up stuff and blame Muslims and spread fear amongst the individuals who are gullible and naive and actually follow you. We are not replying to you right now because you're special and you deserve a reply. La, it's because unfortunately you have a large following. And in this following, you have many people who are naive and will begin to hate their neighbor that is Muslim. People like you are the reasons why there are innocent muhajibat being victimized by those who watch your show. There are muhajibat, whether in Virginia or Minnesota. And we all remember what happened in Minnesota. And we all remember what happened in California. And we remember wherever there is Islamophobia that is rampant, whether it's on the three innocent Muslims that were killed, the, the young man and the two sisters in that parking lot by a radical Islamophobe. These individuals, I beg you, if you look at their search history, they are watching these type of individuals. The irony and the mother of all irony, the um, the mother of all irony, is that when you claim Islam is extremist, when you point your finger like that, do not forget you have three these three pointing back at you, you're spreading extremism. You're spreading hate. You're spreading the fear-mongering rhetoric that leads to innocent Muslims being killed, not Islam. Some say, what about if I see Muslims actually killing other people? We, you know what we call those people? Number one, we can either call them, depending on their ideological stance, they either fall in the category and when they kill people, as individuals who are alone in their behavior, because how many times have we seen many individuals who have a certain ethnicity, whenever they commit a genocide, they're called what? Lone, which animal? Lone what? Lone wolf attack. Whenever a Muslim, and by the way, they always have a mental health at the end of the day too, a mental health issue. A lone wolf, wolves are cool animals, so let's keep calling them something that many people think is cool at the same time. Lone wolf, who has a mental health issue. Whenever a self-proclaimed Muslim or someone brown, that's it, just brown, does something wrong and actually a crime against humanity, number one, we as Muslims condemn it. Number two, they are never mentally deranged. SubhanAllah, every Muslim has the best mental health. Muslims, Muslims, according to very extremist right-wing media platforms, Muslims have the best mental health. They never end up being mentally deranged. They never end up being lone wolves, uh, dogs, cats, whatever. They en never end up being these things. MashaAllah, the Muslims have the best head. They have the best mental health. But whenever it's someone that is not Muslim or doesn't look like a stereotypical Muslim is a perpetrator in these situations, lone wolf and mental health issue immediately. If there really is a mental health situation, then we understand this. But whenever a Muslim pr does something like this, for some reason, it's never them to blame. It's never them. You know who who is to blame? Their religion. How come we're blaming religion all of a sudden? Because we'll go back to this issue now. If religion was the cause, then the billions of practicing Muslims right now would be causing havoc across the world. And it genuinely is, brothers and sisters, a radical minority. And the majority of this minority, brothers and sisters, are not even Muslims. And I will say it right now. A majority of radical extremists are not Muslims. It wasn't me who called them that, non-Muslims. You know who called them non-Muslims? None other than the father of Islam, Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. A louder salawat for our beloved Prophet, sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. No, I said a loud salawat for Rasulullah, Habibullah, Nabiyur Rahmati Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. It was Rasulullah who said, 
that there will be a group of people who will emerge and call themselves Muslims and by Allah they are the farthest away from Islam and they leave Islam as quickly as an arrow leaves its bow after being shot with the maximum pressure of pulling back that bowstring and they are known as the Khawarij and they are the ones who fight Ali and the ones who will fight the Ahlul Bayt and there are these individuals who come today and they fight the Ahlul Bayt even in their death what did they call Najaf? Najaf, what is Najaf to us? Najaf is called Najaf al-Ashraf it's the blessed honorable land of Najaf Khawarij of today, Asr, and these riffraffs, they call it Najaf and Munajjasa. Wal'ayadu billah, astaghfirullah. These people, they represent Muslims. I tell Ben Shapiro, these people represent Islam. The people that want to massacre and desecrate the shrine and the grave of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, self Ali ibn Abi Talib. How are these people Muslims? To you, you can dictate who's Muslim and who's not Muslim. But Rasulullah, I'm going to take what he says above what you say. The next day, you want to call yourself a Nabi? Call yourself Prophet Ben. But I'm going to follow Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He told me who's a Muslim. And he tells me who's not a Muslim. These radicals are not Muslims. These radicals are the biggest disgrace to Islam. And I'm not going to say disgrace to Islam because they were never Muslims to begin with so that I need to be concerned about them in that manner. But I am concerned under one manner. Which manner? The manner of human rights. Brothers and sisters, today, us Muslims, we, are, we should be at the forefront of human rights. It doesn't matter whether you are Muslim or non-Muslim. It was our master, Amir al-Mu'minin, who said it. Humanity is Ali. People are two types. Either you're equals in religion, or either you're brothers in religion, or equals in humanity. If you have a nose, I have a nose. If you have a heart, I have a heart. For that reason, Ya Malik al Ashtar, when you get to Egypt, just treat people like you would your fellow Muslim brother or sister. These golden words should be in the forefront of representing Islam. They are hanged in the entrance of the United Nations right now in New York. People are too. Brothers in religion equals in humanity. Go today, the world's biggest humanitarian organization, the UN, has this on a plaque inside their facility. Why? Because they recognize this is a humanitarian quote. Everyone could recognize this. And I'm not surprised, for it was the man of humanitarianism, Ali ibn Abi Talib. To me, Ali is Muslim. And through him, we become Muslims. You let go of Ali, you forfeit your religion of Islam. These extremists have forfeit Amir al-Mu'mineen. They have forfeit their religion of Islam. We are not swayed by what we see on the news. And we say that that is a representation of me. I speak for myself, not you. And there are many youth that unfortunately fall victim to this. What they see, they believe. Let us inspire our youth to become those who take from multiple sources, not just from one. Be a genuine munsif human being that doesn't only feed their mental health and their brain with one type of source, because this is not healthy. Your information will be contingent on one source. Whatever they say, it goes. La, look at the situation yourself. Read your own book. If they're talking about Islam negatively, read Islam. How do I read Islam? Read the Quran. Read it with the content and context at the same time. Of course, the Qur'an is not just a simple book to read like that. You have to understand its content, context. So what do I do when I want to do that? It's difficult. Look at ulama, lectures. There are lectures. Everything, brothers and sisters, there's no more excuse. Everything is on YouTube. Wa musibata wa YouTube. Everything is on YouTube. Everything. You want to learn more about Islam? Why make the excuse, I don't know how to read Arabi? There's YouTube. Go look. There are websites. Al-Islam.org. Al-Islam.org is a good website to start. Because if you don't start learning yourself, you will begin to allow others to tell you about Islam. Our youth should never be swayed by what they read on the news. They take multiple sources, and this is the healthiest way to feed your news source in your head. This is the healthiest way to do so. 
So when influencers like this man and his riffraff, Ben and, and Men and Nen and whoever else come forth and speak ill of Islam, they are not gullibly swayed by what he is saying until they begin to say, am I really an extremist or not? Our youth should be reasonable and rational and not swayed by the societal norms. Whether people are saying something wrong or doing something wrong, our youth should take the examples of its leaders, of their leaders. Who are their leaders? They're not us, not me. It's not even our ulama. It's our Ahlul Bayt, salallahu alayhi wa alayhima. And at a time like this, there is no better example for our youth than the very youth of Al Muhammad, Al Qasim ibn al Hassan, Al Mujtaba, salallahu alayhi wa sallam alayhi. Al Qasim is the youth from Ali Muhammad. He is the young one from Al Muhammad. Historians say he was between either 11 or 14 years old, a teenager, a teenager, but the heart of a king. The heart of Al-Qasim, brothers and sisters, can never truly be appreciated. Look at the heart of Al-Qasim. I beg you, just look at the heart. Aba Abdullah asks him, he says to him, Ya Bunay, my son, is Al-Qasim Imam al Hussein's son? No, it's not his biological son. Who is the father of Al-Qasim? Who? Imam Al-Hassan alayhi salam. Imam Al-Hassan alayhi salam did not make it to Karbala. He died and was martyred in the 40th year after Hijra by Ju'da bint Al-Ash'ath la'natullah alayha. He died and was martyred in the 50th year after Hijra. In the 40th, Amir al-Mu'minin was martyred. In the 50th, Imam al-Hassan was martyred. And in the 61th year after Hijra, Sayyid al-Shuhada was martyred. So who did Imam al hussein alayhi salam have to remind him of Imam al-Hassan? He had al-Qasim. He had al-Qasim. Al-Qasim, Sayyid al-Shuhada says to him, my son. He calls him Bunay because what? He loves him. He loves him like he loves his own son. Al-Qasim was so beloved by Aba Abdullah that no matter how hard he tried and requested from his uncle, Sayyid al-Shuhada, my master, my uncle, allow me to fight, he would say, no, no, no. I can't lose you. Why? Because you are my only memory of my beloved brother, Al-Hasan, and how I love Al-Mujtaba, the first grandson of Rasulullah. I miss him so much. And you, if you go, who do I have to remind me of him? Go back to your mother. Al-Qasim goes to his mother, Ramla, and she says to him, why aren't you going to fight and making me proud? He says, it's because my uncle says that I remind him of my father. And if I am gone, then he has no memory of his brother, Al-Hassan, salamullah alayhi. And so what does he do? He is then given by his family, his mother, the Imam of Imam Al-Hassan the armor of Imam al-Hassan. He's given the clothes of his father. He's given the sword of Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam. And when he's given this, he goes to the field and he goes to his dad, he goes to his, he goes to his uncle and he says to him, my beloved uncle, I remember my father one time told me, he told me there will be a day in which your uncle will be lonely do not disappoint me on that day, Ya Qasim. Don't disappoint me. There will be a day in which he will be alone. I do not want him to be alone. Ya Qasim, go and defend him. When he comes back with his father's clothes, his imam, his sword, his armor, when he comes back with this, Aba Abdullah begins to cry. Salamullahi alayhi And Hussein alayhi salam. When he cries, you know it's a very serious deal. It's a significant moment when Hussein cries. Imam Hussein never showed weakness in the sign in the face of his enemies. He never showed that emotion to them. But he cries and cries when he sees Al Qasim. Why? Because he remembers his brother Hassan Al Mujtaba when he was poisoned on that day. Al Qasim looks at Aba Abdullah and Aba Abdullah tells him, My beloved nephew, 
How do you see death? Al-Qasim says the line that truly shows his vision and his heart and where his soul is. Listen to this line. He says, Ya Am, in al maut bain yadayk, ahla indi min al asal. Oh, my uncle, surely death between you is sweeter to me than honey. Allahu Akbar. Al-Qasim ahadith say he looked like a failaq badr. في ليلة تمامه وكماله. He looked like that shining moon in its full brightness and completeness. But sometimes you see the red moon, brothers and sisters. This is when Al-Qasim turns into that red moon. He goes to the field and he introduces himself in the following manner. إن تنكروني فأنا نجل الحسن again إن تنكروني فأنا نجل الحسن صبت النبي المصطفى والمؤتمن if you don't know who I am then let me tell you I am the son of Hassan, the son of Rasulullah, the messenger of Allah, Tabarak wa Ta'ala. Al-Qasim goes to the field and he begins to fight one by one the enemies and the men of Yazid fall down to the sword of Al-Qasim and they see him and begin to think, is this Imam al Hassan coming back to life. Al Qasim fights and fights valiantly, and whenever he strikes, he looks at his uncle Abba Abdullah to make sure he sees that he, inshallah, made him proud. Until a hadith say that the sandal of Al Qasim snaps and he goes down to fix it. One la'in goes to Al Qasim. As he is having his head down, he grabs a sword and he strikes the head of Al Qasim, hitting him on his blessed head. Al Qasim screams with the loudest of his voice, Hussein, my uncle Hussein, come and aid me. Hussein, come and aid me. For they have struck your nephew Al-Qasim. Aba Abdullah rushes to the field and he sees the men surrounding him. Aba Abdullah al Hussein removes all of them, kills all of them, and he goes to the body of Al-Qasim alayhi salam and he begins to say how horrible it is when you call your uncle and he is not there to help you. He picks up the body of Al-Qasim but brothers and sisters, how can you pick up a body when its limbs are all over the ground? He takes the body of Al-Qasim back to the tent and he sees at the tent is who? Lady Zainab and Ramla, the mother of Al-Qasim. As he is there, he notices Ramla is not crying and Zainab is not crying. Zainab says to Hussein, Oh Hussein, can you leave the tent? Aba Abdullah says, why? He says, she says, because Ramla wants to mourn her son, but she does not want to break your heart when you see her cry over Al Qasim. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Wa sayalamu ladina zalamu ayyamun qalibin yam qalibun wal aqibatu lil murtaqin. Farajanna ya Allah. اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله Oh Allah, we ask you to bless all of our ill ones and heal all of them برحمتك يا شافي يا معافي Oh Allah, we ask you to raise us with القاسم بن إمام الحسن المجتبى in the day of judgment 
O oh Allah, we ask you to grant us the ziyara of Al Qasim and the ziyara of his father Al Hassan and the ziyara of his uncle Al Hussein. O oh Allah, we ask you to grant us these in this dunya before the akhirah. O oh Allah, we ask you to grant us all of our hajat on these nights, brothers and sisters. The dua is accepted. These are the nights closing, closing the night and the day of Ashura. Make sure you attend these nights, brothers and sisters. These only come once a year. Make the effort, attend out of the love you have for Al Qasim alayhi salam. Wa ila arwah al mu'minina wal mu'minat wal ulama wa shuhada. See ya maman osana bid dua. Rahim Allah man qara surat al mubarakat al fatiha. Tasbukaha salati ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad.